So prayers and routine practice are so very important, but these can easily lose their meaning because we become so familiar uh, with them. I can easily, for instance, pray the Lord's Prayer amongst the most meaningful words ever written, spoken, come to the end and have no idea what I just said. So genuflection is to bend the knee in worship. And it's also got an opposite meaning, which is to pay too much respect for varying reasons. Genuine genuflection is demonstrated by a nun I met in my teens, and I'll talk a bit about her later. And fake genuflection is demonstrated by Herod when Jesus was born. The wise men visited Herod, and Herod said that he wanted to worship the new king. And there are a few more examples. So reflecting on the angels and the wise men and Mary, their responses to the angel, to the events going on around them, it's incredible to see how they act so quickly. The wise men follow the star to take their gifts to the special king. The shepherds rush to Bethlehem to see the thing the angels told them about. And Mary submits her will to the angel. The shepherds and the wise men come to bow and pay homage to the king. I contrast this with the institutional genuflection. And this has always fascinated me, institutional genuflection. What does that mean? And it fascinates me also within myself. The act of routine prayer, routine worship, routine kneeling, routine statements. I know they tend to become meaningless if not reflected upon, if not acted out. They become actions of easy virtue. I'm reminded of Liza, who I met when I was in high school. I was a teen at the time. I didn't meet the nun in high school, um, but I met her at church when I was in my early teens. She taught on prayer one day. And she said that it was easy to lose the meaning of prayers that we say routinely. And one way she kept the meaning in prayer was to act out the prayer as she prayed. If the words emphasized praise, she would act out praise in her body and so on. It's a useful way of trying to keep the meaning of the action. It doesn't stop there, though, because that too can become rote meaningless. So the next step is to tell others of the meaning, to share that meaning. And this is a wonderful way of keeping meaning, to tell stories as we do um, during Advent. I enjoy the MTV Storytellers series because the artists tell stories of the songs and most time um, they, they tell you the background to the song. And sometimes they just tell stories. And it adds meaning to hear the artist speak of that background. But that too, telling others can lose meaning. So another way to maintain, to maintain the meaning is to go to places where one would not ordinarily share. So I've watched others do this. Getting out of one's comfort zone um, doesn't only fill the routine with new meaning, but it passes on that meaning and it watches that meaning generated in others. And then there's the other side of genuflection, paying homage, worship. When the wise men told Herod that they were looking for the new king, Herod asked them to come back to report where they'd found the king so that he too could pay homage. But we know that his intention was not to pay homage. It was to murder the new challenger, um, as demonstrated by his actions um, after that. So living out one's faith in challenging contexts deepens the experience and the meaning. I increasingly feel as though we're moving towards a post-Christian era. Um, and this means that there's incredible opportunity, incredible opportunity to live out our faith. Judeo-Christian faith has always, always been countercultural. Even when the culture has firmly rested upon Judeo-Christian principles, Christians have lived out the ideal. And the ideal is always a judge, always a mirror. 
and so been a place of repentance, of salvation, healing, renewal, reformation, restoration, peace in times of conflict, hope in times of despair, light in times of darkness, joy in times of evil. Father, thank you for Advent, where we can genuflect.